So there's a lot of differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin. And as I've already mentioned, one of the key innovations in Ethereum is the possibility of having a smart uh, contract. So a, a small computer program that actually runs within the blockchain. Indeed, Ethereum is sometimes called um, the virtual Ethereum uh, machine. So, so think of Bitcoin as a payments uh, technology. And think of Ethereum as a smart contracting uh, platform. You can do payments in Ethereum uh, just like you can do in Bitcoin, but there's enhanced uh, capability. So a smart contract is code that can create and transform arbitrary data or tokens um, on top of the blockchain that it's actually part of. Okay, this allows us to trustlessly encode rules for any type of transaction uh, and even create assets from this smart contract. So this is very interesting in terms of what Ethereum has actually done. So there are many tokens that uh, are associated with Ethereum. So it's not just the value of Ethereum when you look at the number of tokens times whatever it's trading for. You need to look at all of the associated tokens with Ethereum. Okay, so this is very, very deep. So you might see that, oh, well, Bitcoin is worth more than Ethereum. Well, that, that's not the whole story here because it doesn't count all of the tokens that are associated uh, with Ethereum. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that these are trustless. So, um, so many of the standard contracts that we deal with in business, for example, an option contract for call options or put options, those are really easy uh, to algorithmically uh, encode. And a smart contract can do that. So for simple contracts, um, these smart contracts are, are just ideal. And again, when you run the smart contract, it runs on every node in the Ethereum network. So it is redundant. Just like every transaction is recorded in the Ethereum uh, network on every single copy of the Ethereum uh, blockchain, and the same thing uh, for Bitcoin in terms of transactions. Okay, so uh, I've already mentioned that this idea is a very general idea. So this is uh, a course that's focused on decentralized finance, but there could be another course that uses much of the same material, but talks about supply chain mechanics. Okay, so this is a very general idea. The low hanging fruit, in my opinion, is finance. And that's where we're seeing most of the innovation today. But this is much more general and there are many other uh, applications. So an important concept in Ethereum is the idea of gas. So you actually pay a gas fee for uh, a transaction. And this is analogous to, let's say you're running a, a computer program on a cloud platform, then you need to actually pay for it. Okay, so, uh, so gas is a very important uh, part uh, of this, but there's like another reason to have the gas. And this is the problem of the infinite loop of code and sometimes known as the halting problem. So, um, so think of a car. And let's say we've got a car that's a self-driving car and it's stuck on autopilot. Nobody's in the car and it just goes. So what is the limiting factor? Gas. So when it runs out of gas, the car stops. Okay, it's the same thing in a smart contract. That once you run out of gas, then the contract stops. 
Okay, so if there was uh, some flaw in the code that caused it to loop and loop and loop, it would only go for so long. An infinite loop would be a disaster for the network because every single computer is doing the same thing and it would take uh, the computing power of the network. So this is something that's special to Ethereum. Uh, it is a Turing complete um, protocol and Bitcoin is not. Of course, Bitcoin doesn't run uh, smart contracts. So, so gas is important. It's also um, for an attacker. Um, somebody wanted to attack the network it would be very expensive because if they run up a lot of computations, then they have to pay for it in terms of the gas. So let me give you a little more detail in terms of how gas works, because it is important for decentralized finance. So uh, there are two things that are important. First, the amount of gas, and second, the price of gas. Okay, so if you're trying to think about uh, driving a car from point A to B, well, you need to figure out how much gas you actually need to do that, but the actual cost will be the amount of gas times the gas price. So very simple uh, transactions on the Ethereum network, uh, they are done um, with a relatively low uh, gas fee. But as the uh, transactions become more complicated, so perhaps the, there's multiple steps in the actual transaction, when that happens, the price uh, becomes higher because the amount of gas that you need is, uh, is much more. Okay, so uh, the gas is usually uh, measured in terms of uh, the unit uh, called a giga way. So way is the smallest unit in Ethereum and a giga way is a billionth of uh, one ether. Okay, so the prices are quoted and the prices are actually determined by effectively an auction. So again, there are two things here. How much gas do I need? That's fairly straightforward because we can figure out the computing steps that are necessary for the candidate a transaction. So you can figure out uh, how much gas is needed, but then you actually need to go purchase that gas. And the price of gas can vary depending upon uh, the particular uh, network uh, congestion. So if a lot of people are using uh, the network, the price of gas actually goes up and it could become a very uh, expensive. Okay, so I've actually got some calculations here as to how uh, this could work in terms of the network cost. And the way that it works is the following. That you've got an estimation of how much gas is actually needed to do um, the transaction. And this is all kind of automatic. And suppose that you actually send more gas than is needed. So when you do that, whatever residual is left over is refunded to you. Okay, And who gets the, uh, the gas fee? Well, the miners. It's an, another incentive for them to do the work. And if you send not enough gas, and the transaction gets, let's say, halfway through and then runs out of gas, then you lose that gas and the associated um, value that it cost you. So to run half a computer program, too bad. You're not getting any refund because it's already been run. But if there's surplus, it actually uh, goes back to you. So this has been uh, a significant issue in terms of the the price of gas, um, the price has been, the gas prices have varied uh, this year between 50 and 700 uh, gig away. So uh, simple transactions were becoming really very expensive. And when these transactions become expensive, then 
uh, you kind of decrease the efficiency of these markets. And the problems that they're supposedly solving, um, they're not really solving because the cost of transaction is so uh, large. So, so this is an ongoing uh, problem, but there are solutions uh, in the future to basically make sure that these gas fees uh, are lower. So one thing is the Ethereum Improvement Protocol uh, 1599, which will change the Ethereum blockchain uh, and in a way that has got a number of advantages. Uh, it will allow more transactions. Uh, and importantly, the, the base fee for the gas is going to be burned. So burning, we haven't talked about yet, but we will. And basically what that does is it takes the Ethereum out of circulation. So it destroys it. So currently, it just goes to the miners. So in taking this out of the circulation, it is actually worse for the miners, but it actually serves to decrease the rate of increase in Ethereum, potentially making Ethereum more valuable. The miners still get some money for doing this because users can send them a tip to actually do their transaction. So the idea is pretty uh, straightforward. If you want your transaction uh, dealt with quickly, then you need to pay a premium. You do that in Bitcoin, you do that in Ethereum. So again, uh, this will make, uh, we believe, the cost of gas go down and also make uh, Ethereum uh, more uh, valuable. Um, so, I talked about the Ethereum improvement uh, protocol. There's also ERC. So ERC is Ethereum request for comment. And this is very important because it essentially allows new things to be created within the uh, Ethereum architecture. So the most popular is the ERC20, which delivers uh, a token interface. It allows you to create a token that resides in the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Okay, so this is a, a great innovation to ERC-20. Uh, in my uh, teaching, we create our own tokens and uh, the, the uses are, are very, very interesting. So ERC-20, which we'll go into in more detail later in the course, is a fungible token. So that means that uh, every ERC token is identical in value. So think of a, a, like a $1 bill in a fiat currency. Uh, every $1 bill has the same value. And indeed, 10 $1 bills equals a, t a $10 bill. This is what fungibility actually means. There's another ERC called ERC721. And this is a non-fungible token and sometimes known as an NFT. So with this token, the value is unique to that token. So the token is representing something. Uh, sometimes we call them deeds. Uh, and, and recently they've become uh, quite popular in terms of representing pieces of art or videos, even tweets. So uh, the benefit of these ERCs is that the developers can create code for one interface that they're working on, but given that you're compliant with the ERC-20, the token can be used in many different applications. So this is the idea of interoperability, which we'll spend a fair bit of time uh, talking. So oracles are something that is also uh, really important to understand. So we know what the word oracle means, but within the DeFi space, uh, it's got a special meaning. So a blockchain is self-contained. So a blockchain doesn't use information from outside the blockchain unless 
there's an agreement upon an oracle. And an oracle is a way to bring information from outside a blockchain construct to the blockchain. Okay, so this could be a data source. It could be the price of gold. It might be the price of Apple stock. That, that information doesn't reside on uh, the Ethereum blockchain. So how can we get that information in? And we actually have to build it into our smart contract and it goes outside of the blockchain to collect that information. And it's important that that information is reliable because if it's unreliable, that will create a problem for the smart uh, contract. Okay, so, so essentially this is a big problem um, in, uh, in decentralized finance. It's a challenge to get a credible oracle. And there's many different companies that are working on this, and Chainlink is one company that is uh, basically got a decentralized solution uh, to the Oracle uh, problem. Um, but again, this is a challenge to get data from outside a blockchain uh, into a blockchain.